All right, good evening. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to uh, tonight's Wake County Board of Education meeting. I want to call this meeting to order. If everybody rise with me uh, and say the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under All right, we do have a quorum, so we'll turn it over to our superintendent, Kathy Moore, for comments. Good evening and Happy New Year. I'd like to remind everyone that the deadline to apply to Magnet and or year-round schools is Thursday, January 30th. There's still time for parents to explore their Magnet and year-round options and apply to schools they feel would be a good fit for their child. Tomorrow morning, there is a Magnet Elementary Mini Fair at North Forest Pines Elementary from 9.30 to 11 a.m. Tomorrow evening, parents of rising middle schoolers can attend an information session at Holly Grove Elementary from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Magnet schools will also be offering multiple tours over the next two weeks to provide a first-hand look at what they have to offer. Our magnet programs are consistently cited as a national model, maximizing student potential while promoting diversity. The variety of magnet themes offered from world languages to technology supports core belief number four, which calls for schools to support a culture of continuous improvement, risk taking and innovation. And magnet schools intentionally create diverse school populations aligning with core belief number five, which says that we value a diverse school community that is inviting, respectful, inclusive, flexible, and supportive. We are fortunate in this district to be able to offer a variety of educational opportunities for our families. I hope that many parents and students will take time in the coming weeks to explore their application school options. Visit wcpss.net slash magnet to learn more. It's time once again for Wake Up and Read, the annual book drive that has collected hundreds of thousands of books for students who need them the most. Now in its eighth year, Wake Up and Read this year hopes to collect at least 130,000 new and gently used books to be distributed to about 8,000 students at 12 WCPSS schools and 17 child care centers. There will be a kickoff event this Saturday from noon to 2 at Wake Up and Read's new headquarters at 1820 Capitol Boulevard. This year's drive goes until February 15th. Drop-off sites can be found at most of our schools as, as well as many local businesses. Visit wakeupandread.org for more information. Finally tonight, I'd like to share the story of one of our outstanding teachers, Bradley Shepstead of Rollsville Middle School. Mr. Shepstead was recently recognized as WRAL's Teacher of the Week for his use of video game technology to help develop positive character traits in his students. Please turn your attention to the monitors to see his approach in action. Computer game based approach to teaching. That's how one teacher enhances his classroom experience. Micaiah Thurman went to Roseville Middle to meet our teacher of the week. Welcome to Classcraft. If you wonder what video gaming has to do with a language arts class, look no further than Bradley Shepstead's classroom. For example, his students are focused in class discussions to ensure that their virtual characters get the perks. They get rewarded for doing good things, completing their homework, being helpful. Shepstead is one of two teachers piloting the class craft program. Each of his middle school students get superpowers. Basically, it's positive rewards. And then when they don't do things that they're supposed to do, like turn in their homework or they say something not kind, their character loses points. Shepstead's yeah. students love the creative approach. Yeah, he so, says so it allows them to the also learn complex life skills like forgiveness and team building. If somebody's character um, falls in battle, we call it, then it actually affects their whole team. Shep so said knows it's in, critical yeah, to meet a students smart, where they are. Courageous. That connection allows him to build bonds yeah. and make a it's positive a impact that lasts beyond the school year. Two. I just wanted to bridge the gap for students who perhaps don't have that role model at home, um, who don't have a dad at home. Um, you know, I didn't have a dad. Um, at home and so I wanted to be that person for 
somebody else. Because it's because of that dedication to his students that we honor Bradley Shepstead as our WREL Teacher of the Week. Micaiah Thurmond, WREL News, Roseville. And congratulations to him. To nominate someone you think should be our Teacher of the Week, go to WREL.com and search teacher. Students excel when they are exposed to the arts. And Thank you. <laughs> that concludes my comments. Uh, thank you, Superintendent Moore. Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, our first board meeting of the year. Welcome to a uh, new year, new decade. Uh, we all are excited and energized, and I hope that uh, all of our teachers and students and uh, staff for tapping into their own superpowers after uh, a much needed uh, break and reset as we get into a, a new year. So again, just welcome everyone uh, back and uh, looking forward to getting started. Uh, so we'll start with uh, board comments. I'll start with uh, this end uh, today. So Mr. Hagerty. All right. Thank you, Chairman Sutton. Hope everyone had a wonderful break, a good holiday season, and uh, I'm glad we're all back and ready to do the good work we're here to do. Uh, during the break, I had the opportunity to meet with one of the Leesville Road High School's AP government classes. And we had a wonderful day, um, seemed like it was a day, it was a long class, of asking questions of the students, getting their feedback on everything. And one thing that came up is some of you might have uh, noted this is an election year. And we always talk about the youth getting involved in government and politics and doing their civic duty. Many of the students were unaware, and I didn't know how many of you were aware, that many of our high school seniors will be able to vote in the primary elections this year, even if they've not yet turned 18. North Carolina law states that individuals who will be 18 years old and otherwise eligible to vote can vote in the primaries if they will be 18 by our November 3rd election day. So rather than an 18 year old barrier, you can be, what is it, 17 years and four months? <laughs> and vote this year. So we just want to encourage all of our students, regardless of their beliefs or creeds, that if they want to get involved in their government and do their civic duty, they can vote in this year's primary. Thank you. Thank you for that. Ms. Mahaffey. I have some exciting news from December, um, where Olive Chapel Elementary's principal and Wake County's current principal of the year, Bruce Steininger, was named the 2020 Regional Principal of the Year for the North Central Region of North Carolina by the um, North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, and she will go on to compete for the state title of North Carolina Principal of the Year. I know there are a lot of Olive Chapel Clippers that are very, very excited for Dr. S and wishing her the best. Ms. Johnson Hostler. Absolutely. Congratulations. Um, I also got the opportunity, not with Mr. Haggerty, but several of us were in the um, class as well. Um, I, this is the only thing I'll have in my uh, comments, but I'll note that we did not talk about changing our start time. That's all we talked about for the last three years that I've gone to the AB class. This year, they wanted to talk about why I got in um, to politics and being a public servant because they could vote this year. And so that so this was my first year in four years that we actually had a very different conversation um, about all of our individual personal rule, um, rights and, quite frankly, privileges in this country to engage in, um, in politics and civic engagement so it was a great opportunity to share with students and they were not short on questions so it was a great opportunity thank you mr. Fletcher thank you mr. chairman and again happy new year uh, uh, people seem to be walking with a brisk pace and uh, expectant uh, expectant smiles on their faces um, next Monday uh, the BA Board Advisory Council for District 9 will meet at Reedy Creek Elementary School at 5.30. This is Monday the 13th. Our discussion will be social emotional learning with Paul Coe and uh, Maurice Pettiford. And looking forward to a robust discussion uh, about that so we have a more informed public. Um, very excited about Wake Up and Read. This consortium of organizations that we provide leadership to is um, does amazing work and you think about if you've ever been one of the book distributions where the children get to choose books that they think they want to read 
um, and they, they are their books. They take them, they put a label in them, that's my book, it's got my name on it, I take it home and I get to read it, and if I want to give it to my sibling or to a neighbor, I can do that. It's, it's marvelous, and it deals with the the, the research that says in low-income communities there is essentially one book for every 300 families. One children's book for every 300 families. And this is a major effort that the school district leads and the community supports in terms of putting books in the kids' hands in a, in a reasonable way. Just imagine the labor and the interest and the time it takes to sort 130,000 books into grade level classifications. Uh, a lot of work is done, a lot of heart is put into it. Um, and for those of you who, who just hang on what's going on in the facilities committee, it's going to be delayed one week this month because of the, the, the start that we have. So it will be on the, uh, whatever that day is, tomorrow is the 8th, so it will be on the 15th as opposed to tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Cash. I have no comments. Oh. Thank you. Happy New Year, everybody. I just wanted to wish everyone a happy New Year. Let's make 2020 a, a, a wonderful year. Well. Dr. Martin. I'll add my Happy New Year and no further comments. I'm Ms. Scott. But now the pressure's on to be really brief, um, <laughs> so I'll set aside all this. Uh, no, <laughs> is that what it was for? Um, I wanted to congratulate Rollsville High School's basketball team. Both the men's and women's team did really well in their holiday invitationals, and I know a lot of our high school basketball teams participated, but my son and I actually uh, made it out for the championship game, and unfortunately, Rollsville High School came in second, uh, but they, they played really well. It was my son's first basketball game, and we sat right behind the team, so it was really exciting for him. And then um, he finally started to put to use our basketball hoop uh, that evening. I also had to remind him at his first game that he didn't want to say anything about the, uh, the calls that were made by the officials. And then me yeah. being... <laughs> And you, you can take the girl out of Indiana. Uh, but so I had to bite my own tongue a few times. <laughs> That's traveling now? What? Uh, no, but it was a great game and a great, great sportsmanship from, from our players. So Roseville has a lot to be proud of. Uh, the Nightdale Chamber is right now hosting a, a school supply drive for Nightdale Elementary. And that is just yet another way the Nightdale community just really embraces its schools, its community members, and it, and it truly is a place for everybody. Uh, and also over the break, I had, I'm going to try to be vague, but I spoke with a, an occupational therapist who may or may not work at a school in District 1. Um, but I was thinking about the, the, the movie The Breakfast Club, uh, being a, a Gen Xer, uh, and, and towards the end of the movie at the part that says, well, it's the kids haven't changed, it's you who's changed. And I was thinking about that when we're looking at the way our children learn and we see a lot of increased stress. And the occupational therapist mentioned that there is such a lack of vestibular stimulation these days because we took out the, the teeter-totters from the playground, we took out the swings, we took out the, the merry-go-rounds, and, and you don't get that. And as a parent who has a child who's been through private occupational therapy, that was like just part of OT every time was swinging. You did the taco swing and the blanket, and, uh, and that was something to think of. So I hope that we can just sort of keep that seed planted in our head as we think about what you know what how we keep better serving our students because you know that was something like from from the mouth of uh, someone who's in there every day noticing that that is something that we don't have on our playgrounds anymore uh, but but it was a great conversation and I of course want to want to thank this uh, random occupational <laughs> uh, anonymous rather occupational therapist for all that that uh, this person does and for all that our uh, support staff do for our teachers happy new year Okay, well, thank you for that, those comments. Uh, we now move to our portion of the agenda where we hear from our community through public comment. Approval of the I'm agenda. Sorry. Motion to approve the meeting agenda. Second. Got a motion and a second to approve tonight's uh, agenda. All those in favor, show by sign of aye. Aye. 
Aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Uh, agenda is approved. Yeah. Okay, well, we're now at public comment. Uh, something is not working in our system. It's loading here. I do have the speakers. So speakers have three minutes. Uh, I think most of the folks know what those rules are because it looks like everyone are uh, look like familiar speakers. What are the rules? No, no personnel items. What are Jonathan? Do you have those rules? Yeah. It's, 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 uh, policy three one of three minutes. No personnel. No student confidential. Okay. All right, so our first speaker is Megan Balch. And as she's coming, citizens who sign up to address the board during public comment will be called on in priority order, first for items on the agenda and then for items not on the agenda. Each individual speaker will be allowed three minutes for remarks. Specific personnel or student matters are not appropriate for the public comment setting, but may be addressed through applicable WCPSS personnel, the grievance policy, or other applicable policies. Thank you. All right, Ms. Bulch. I'm speaking on the grievance policy, which is on your agenda to review for a second reading. Um, the point of due process and grievance procedures is to have a system of checks and balances to ensure decisions have been made without discrimination, procedural errors, and on facts and data. For the duration of the 2018-19 school year, um, I had the pleasure of waiting out your grievance process. I learned that in order to have the school board appeal for a decision, it can take a long seven months. It doesn't matter if your child is suffering 59 repeated medical incidents, the parent must wait. So when I saw grievance policy was being addressed, I thought possibly you'd be amending your procedure to be more efficient and without unnecessary delay. Possibly even a statement of how or when a school board should, or school should be notified that the board has ruled in a parent's favor. Possibly how much time a board has to ensure a school has complied with their corrective actions. Instead, there continue to be 10-day limits on parents to file grievances and appeals and no limit on the time for discovery of additional evidence by the board, which can extend the five and a half month time frame already to seven months. There continues to be no limit to the implementation for a decision made in April of 2019 that has yet to be implemented. Grievance procedures. You have to have a, a clear process that allows objective opinions in order to make decisions that are fair and impartial. If a system is lacking a process that is effective and efficient with a clear timeline and ability to make decisions then, and how and when to deliver their decisions, then that process is obsolete. The process of a parent grievance procedure, which is on a second reading today, is lacking exact timelines, a definition of um, the timeline for the collection of additional evidence, and gives no final decision procedure. If you look on that page, it states that you will give a, a um, notice in 20 days, but it doesn't say you're ever even going to notify the school. It doesn't say if you're going to mail it to the person's home. It doesn't tell you how you're going to notify them. And there's nothing that follows up as if, if it has been complied to in that statement. So if you look at policy code 1740, which is up for tonight, it would be E on your final page that says, the board panel will provide a final written decision within 20 days of the level three hearing unless the panel determines that additional time is needed for further review. So I'm assuming mine is still in that additional time needed. Um, I received my copy, but the school has yet to receive it. Um, and there's no indication then um, when the school is notified, um, there's no disclosure given. Further, there's no process for a parent to have input on development of a new policy or a grievance of a current policy, specifically in the area of graduation requirements. Right now, if I had a child that was 18 years or older who had been in the self-contained environment their entire education and who was able to pass a GED and he would like to receive a diploma upon graduation, your county cannot consider that. And there's nothing in any of the grievance procedures that indicates that this would even be a possibility to be grieved. Your current policy and DPI's policy is that students must demonstrate content proficiency. Wouldn't a GED exam passing score equate to that possibility. Other counties in our state have considered this. Thank you. Thank you. And now for off agenda speakers, uh, we'll start with Elizabeth Temple.
Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for letting me be here tonight to share some comments with you um, and to submit to the records uh, a couple of articles. My name is Elizabeth Temple. I would like to share a letter I wrote and submitted to the Johnstonian News June 3rd, 2019, although this matter is closed. Record shows teachers' commitment to justice and equality. Regarding the March 25, 2019 article in the Johnstonian News, Wake County teacher denies MLK Trump comments. A man I never met wrote things online about me that are not true. I'm a certified K-12 teacher in North Carolina with 21 years in the public schools, as well as seven years of substitute teaching in public schools for a total of 28 years in the North Carolina schools. In the initial story by the Johnstonian News, the awards I have in my community service with the NAACP were not reported or pictured, nor was it mentioned that I was a certified mentor teacher K-12 in Wake County. I'm writing to share it in a letter to the editor. I assisted the Reverend William Barber with, this, with some concerns of the NAACP and was with him on the front page of the Daily Record newspaper in Dunn. I joined the NAACP as a, new, a dues-paying member. I attend Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. breakfast and events each year. I am pictured with my mostly African-American courses and orchestras and was hired by four African-American principals over the years. I have a master's degree and completed half of a PhD at the UNC um, at Greensboro. I served on school improvement teams at two schools and completed an internship in school administration at Campbell University and made all A's. I received many notes from former students and certificates that they made by hand of appreciation and love and recognition certificates from principals for dedicated service. A teacher wrote a letter to me when I assisted the choir for the African Americans killed in a church in South Carolina called Unity Through Music in Greenville. The teacher wrote me a thank you note and wrote that there is much ignorance in the South, but not in the Temple family. I created and taught music lessons on Black History Month. Every year we love all people. I worked at Christian churches for 16 years as an organist and choir director and volunteer in my church choir. And um, so I'd like to submit the original newspaper article and a copy of that, please. And then if I could hand that to someone really fast. And then, um, thank you. And then the reporter who researched this and who um, tried to speak to board members, he's deceased. He died of a heart attack in December and I brought his obituary. And, um, this is the article that he wrote, the original and the copy. And he was also an ordained minister, as well as a reporter. And then, um, my time is almost out, but I said we're all one race, the human race, and um, that we're all one. Those were my comments that I made to the class, and those are included in the article and were also researched at the school. And then Alveda King, thank I do you, follow her you. on Your social media. Time has expired. And thank you very much. Thank you. Amanda Harrison. My name is Amanda Harrison, and I'm a member of the Triangle Area Dyslexic Advocacy Group, who are a parent-led group that encourages the empowerment of parents by connecting them with resources and information so they can advocate on behalf of children, uh, excuse me, on behalf of their own children. We also work alongside other advocacy groups within North Carolina, and together we are striving for positive and meaningful change that will benefit all children who learn differently. I want to speak today about teacher licensing and how Wake County Public Schools disclose information regarding whether or not a teacher is licensed to teach. The Department of Public Instruction maintains North Carolina teaching license information on their website. This allows a member of the general public to verify a license by searching a name or on a license number. The Wake County Public Schools website also redirects a member of the public to this same web page when searching for a teacher license. This should make searching for the credentials of a teacher very easy. One would think that this information is freely available to parents. On numerous occasions, our parent members have found that a particular teacher's license shows expired in this system. 
Some parents report that their children appear to be being taught by teachers whose licences are expired according to the DPI web system. When parents attempt to verify the, this information, they are given a variety of confusing answers to their questions. In one particular case, a licence, according to the system, appeared to be two years out of date. When this was questioned, parents were unable to obtain licensing information for that particular member of staff. The parents were then passed between Wake County staff and the DPI. Between the two departments, the license information for that particular teacher was never disclosed to these parents. School staff and particular district staff are informing parents that the responsibility for updating this system lies within the DPI. And when information is out of date, parents are then told that the system has simply not been updated. Parents then communicate with the DPI, only to be told it's actually Wake County's responsibility to update licensing information. One member of staff at the DPI even told a parent, it's not our concern if a teacher in Wake County is not licensed. Parents are understandably upset with a system that does not appear to work in the way that it is intended. A parent should not, excuse me, a parent should be able to obtain accurate information about any teacher working in Wake County. A parent should know that the information is correct and has been verified and that the information is current. Thank you. Carrie Bla. I'll just leave these here. Um, Blaine Dillard posted a blog today outlining the Student Achievement Committee meeting that you had last November where you were discussing the progress of MVP Open Up Resources in EL Education. There's very little that I can do to add to that. It was an outstanding report. I hope every member involved with these curriculums takes the time to read every word and watch the video. In the absence of any clean data on student achievement and grades and EOGs in this area, you will have to put yourself in the position where the anecdotal data will outweigh your usable numbers. While I can add little to Blaine's information, you know my views on MVP because I've been speaking about it for 10 months. Information that was also not represented in that community meeting one year ago concerning open up resources. My son piloted your open up resources in the fourth quarter of his seventh grade year in the spring of 2018, well before your SAC meeting, before full impl implementation of open up resources. His pilot was a disaster on a monumental scale. The students were left with only three or four class grades at the end of that quarter. Test weighed 95% at one point and it was only caught by me. The chaos resulted in our area superintendent's assistant having to provide fake doubled grades to give the illusion that the students were evaluated appropriately and given the opportunity to use their skills to affect their academic scores. It was all an illusion. To my knowledge, no parent in that class was made aware of these discrepancies except myself who was, saw that the math was off, questioned it and forced the issue. The teacher was unable to provide extra practice problems during that pilot. Test scores were ridiculously low. As I couldn't even get the uh, correct answer key to check her grades. At one point I was told this was a pilot so the teacher didn't have to keep her answer key. After listening to the rosy picture of open up resources painted in that math team SAC meeting, I was disturbed. How on earth can an evaluator evaluate a child's math comprehension in that chaos? And it has continued. You will never hear stories like mine. Mr. Martin, Ms. Cash, Ms. Mahaffey, I've listened to that SAC meeting 12 times. Almost everything you said was spot on. You were our champions. You were protecting our kids. You were bringing the concerns that you said you heard at the polls. It was amazing. I'm going to use my time to do this. This is your EL program. My daughter in the fourth grade without your EL program was introduced to these books in her classroom. This year in the fifth grade, she's reading this, and that is all. A coffee table book by Jackie Robinson that I can't afford to buy, and she has one at school that can't come home, and one book on the rainforest. This is your EL program. Pete 
Blah. Happy New Year. Uh, so I want to start off by reading something, a uh, direct quote from the Student Achievement Committee meeting from November 19th, 2018, uh, the review of new curriculum implementation, which was roughly four months before we started coming here and talking to you every two weeks. At 39 minutes and 20 seconds, Mr. Martin made a comment saying, what I'm not seeing and what I also hear from families is that. I hear a little bit of a sort of pendulum swinging. We've historically been way to one extreme, which is just direct, thou shalt do this, follow this pattern. In fact, I'm always nervous when I hear Khan Academy because Khan has traditionally been very much do this, do this, then do this, then do this. There's no learning that takes place there. It's just completely repeating. But if I flip to the other side where it's just conversation, then like I tell my students, you're not likely to learn quantum mechanics on your own. It's gonna require some direct instruction to say, here's some framework, now let's build on it. Let's take this piece and now build this piece. That's what I haven't been seeing. Um, glad everybody's sitting down, but I would like to say, I agree with you 100%. The pendulum swing is something that I work with every day. I work for a Fortune, Fortune 60 IT company in RTP. In IT, things change overnight, which means we are constantly throwing things out, swinging a pendulum, and then waiting for it to fall to the middle, which is where you actually get success and move forward. What we're seeing on our end, and the question that I have is, is why does it appear that either you or the staff or NCDPI, because I don't really know who it is anymore, is holding the pendulum up on the right corner. We're not letting it fall to the middle. This is something that our kids need. They do need to be able to problem solve, but you cannot continue to ask them to solve problems to which they have not been given the information prior to be able to do that. It's the equivalent of you handing a box of parts and say, go build a car. If you have no mechanical skills, if you have no, um, if you've never taken a class, if you've never been taught where they go, yeah, you might get lucky a couple times, but you're not going to put something together that's gonna go from A to B. What we're asking for is both. Give us some instruction and we can talk about the problem part. You've heard numerous groups talk about how this is a supplemental program, so let's use it as such. Give us something that gives direct instruction, as you talked about, and give us something that allows them to be able to do problem solving right after it. Because asking them to do one or the other is not going to get us to the next step. Thank you. Rachel Askew. Good evening, and thank you for giving me the chance to speak. Um, I, over Christmas break, um, I was lucky enough to have some time off, and I found myself staying up late and sleeping in, and in a lot of those late nights, I've watched board meetings and SAC meetings and read surveys. I've watched them ad nauseum. I've watched them from other cities, comparable size um, school boards as school ca counties as this. I've watched Fairfax and Modesto and places in Missouri. I've watched all kinds of different things, and the one thing that I took from it that we do not have here is if you look around this room, there are probably at least twice, if not three times as many Wake County employees in this room as there are parents. Why are there not parents here? Why are you guys not encouraging people to come in and get involved in this process? Why is it we come up here and there's a glass wall? That glass wall, we talk at you, you do not talk back. In Modesto, they said, does anyone have questions? Does anyone have any feedback on this? We'd like to hear from you. We don't hear from you guys. We ask you questions on Twitter, you don't respond. You don't respond on Facebook. Emails sometimes, sometimes not. Why is it us versus you guys? Why isn't it all of us working together? Um, I would like to see the board change their policy to make it a more interactive process. I think that would encourage more parents to get involved, and I think it would give you guys a better chance to get to know the parents. Find out that we're not all these evil, crazy people. We're just looking out for our kids. Um, when you go to the Supreme Court of the United States, they are allowed to interrupt. They're allowed to jump in while I'm talking and ask me questions because it gives them more context. It gives them a better understanding of what I am saying and what I'm arguing. You guys, at least you guys are, for the most part, all looking, not everybody. I've seen a lot of people looking down and typing and doing other things, whatever it is, I don't know. If you're updating your Instagram, whatever. But 
they are all fully attentive to the person speaking, and they are interactive with the person speaking. Why don't we have that? I don't understand. Um, I really found interesting in a lot of these meetings is that the things you guys are saying that um, it's just one parent, it's just another parent, no. Back in 2017, the teachers were telling you guys, no MVP, it is a mess. We hear, oh, everything's rosy. There were all, all good, positive things from the teachers and the students. That is not true. It is absolutely not true. And I have gone through so many surveys and found so many teacher comments that say, no, everything you addressed later that said, oh, well, maybe we need to fix this. They told you two years ago and you didn't listen. I don't know if you guys didn't listen. I don't know if you guys got duped by your staff. I don't know if somebody else came up with the ideas and then presented them to you and nobody did the research. But it's there. If I can find it late nights over my Christmas break, you guys can find it. I'm just a parent. I'm not a board member. I understand. and. Being on the board is difficult, and I am glad you guys all ran for the position, but it is an election year, and I want to know why. Why did you want this position? Was it for political social manipulation? Was it because you really care about education? Was it because you want to see numbers in North Carolina go up? So we say, hey, look, our numbers are up. Well, that's great, but if they're artificially up, it doesn't matter. It's not serving the kids. So since it is an election year, and I know some of you are moving on to higher positions, was this a stepping stone? I don't know. Thank you. Sean Pollins. Uh, hey guys, um, really unprepared. I just ran in late. Uh, traffic was hard on 40 today. Um, I didn't prepare a speech, but I wrote some notes. So forgive me if this, if the tone seems wrong. My, my intention is to be nothing but friendly in this um, discussion today. Um, but I am concerned, um, as both a citizen and an attorney, um, about some First Amendment violations, or what I perceive to be First Amendment violations, and not just by this board, um, but also by the Raleigh City Council and by the Board of Commissioners. I've seen them at all three local bodies. Um, but I, I'm coming to you today, just this afternoon, um, the City Council unanimously approved uh, rule changes to the rules of decorum, um, which previously I couldn't have said any of their names as city council members at those meetings. Um, they approved changes that, that removed that restriction. Uh, and they also made um, a sign-up process that was more user-friendly. Uh, honestly, I told them that your process was flawless for signing up to speak. Um, and they adopted one that was actually even a little bit better because it didn't open at noon on the day of. It opened right after the end of their last meeting. So they approved those changes unanimously. Um, and as you know, that, that was a new council that came on and did that, um, you know, after they were challenged on the issue. So I'm challenging you now um, on your First Amendment issues. Um, I'll start with, uh, you know, I, I just, I went back looking, I started in 2018, and by April of 2018, I'd found two violations. Um, the first one was on February 20th of 2018, um, at the 38 minute mark on YouTube. And I'll, if, if you guys want, I'll send you the videos with like the timestamps for you to make it easier for you to review them. I don't know if you'll care to or not. But uh, a woman was silenced um, for speaking about what she claimed was an assault that occurred um, on her son uh, by a teacher. Uh, he didn't stand up for the national anthem. I don't know if you guys remember this from a couple years back. He didn't stand for the anthem. I don't know what happened, but the, the, the mother was talking about it, and she was um, silenced by the board attorney. Um, and the, the, her son actually spoke after that and was also interrupted several times um, trying to communicate a, a matter of public concern. Um, uh, in April, April 10th of 2018, a mother, well, actually an aunt, was talking about her niece. Um, there was also mention of some physical assault that may have occurred. I think it was by a student this time, and, and the issue of restraining orders was brought up, and she wanted to talk to the policy of how restraining orders are handled in the school, but she was interrupted. Um, and then just last meeting on December 17th of 2019, um, I believe I got in here late, but I was listening to YouTube on the car. I believe the woman is actually in the room who was interrupted last time um, when she was speaking about her own child, again, and some academic issues. Um, I, I understand there are concerns with confidentiality and privacy, but if anyone has the right to divulge uh, things that are happening to their children, it is the parents and the family members. I hope that you guys will consider that in the future. Thank you. Okay, that concludes uh, public comment. I will now entertain a motion to approve tonight's consent agenda. So moved. 
second. second. Got a motion and a second to approve tonight's consent agenda. Are those in favor? Sure, by the time of I. Aye. Any opposed, nay? Ayes have it. Mr. Chair, I had a question um, regarding our second readings, um, specifically 4A. This was, Ms. Kushner, will you, I think I remember correctly, this was based off of a technical correction, the student grievance policy. So yes. it is something that we would be open to feedback on still and, and listening and hearing more about. Yes, the um, current, the second reading that was approved is for technical correction to make sure that we add language um, about un inaccurate information that's in a student record and giving mm -hmm. parents the right to remove or challenge that inaccurate information. Okay. So that was a technical correction we did not want to hold up. Um, so that's why it is proceeding on second reading, but it has been brought to the attention of, of me um, to the policy committee that we will bring this back. And I, so I will meet with staff to um, incorporate some of the concerns or to address some of the concerns that have been raised in public comment. Okay, thank you. And talked with um, Chair Sutton. I, we, we talked right before the meeting about um, going forward on this. Thanks. Any other questions or concerns? All right, hearing none, I will entertain a motion for us to go into closed session. Um, Mr. Sutton, I would move to consider uh, confidential personnel information protected under GS 143-318-1111A1, A3, and A6, and 115C-319 to consult with the Board of Education attorney and preserve the attorney-client privilege as provided for under GS 143-318.11A3 and to consult with the Board of Education attorney and preserve the attorney-client privilege as provided in GS 143-318.11A3 due to current litigation. Uh, the cases J.G. by and through his parents, L.R. and D.G. versus Wake County Public School System, Board of Education, case number 19, EDC 04496, and N.V., a minor, and Jenny and Derek of Lasati, individually on behalf of N.V. versus Wake County Board of Education, Eastern District of North Carolina, 517 CV 0578. For those purposes, I, I uh, move that we go into closed session. Second. Got a motion and a second to go into closed session for the items just stated. All those in favor, show by sign of aye. Any opposed, nay? Ayes have it. We now are in closed session. Thank you.